Good evening and welcome to the new school. So my name is Michelle DePass. I'm uh, the Tishman Professor for Environment and Sustainability, Dean of the Milano School and Director of Tishman Environment and Design Center. And no, just <laughs> joking. <laughs> So I really want to thank you all for joining us here uh, for our third annual Earth Day celebration. And since you've chosen to be here at the New School tonight, you know, uh, or if you're tuning in on live stream, you know that this is not your average Earth Day celebration. This is your superior, supreme Earth Day celebration. <laughs> so we're really happy you can join us tonight. Uh, just so you know, if you're new to the New School, that the New School was actually founded out of an act of resistance in 1919 by a small group of prominent American intellectuals and educators who were frustrated by intellectual, intellectual timidity uh, at traditional colleges. And they envisioned a new kind of American academic institution where faculty and students would be free to engage and address honestly and directly the issues and challenges of the day. And so this is the vein of why we are here today. And it's also the vein of how the Tishman Center sees our mode of inquiry. Um, the center fosters bold design, policy, and justice approaches to environmental issues uh, of the day. And we are really working hard to be able to think about and bring about opportunities for advancing just and sustainable outcomes. So tonight, we are continuing the university's tradition by celebrating native and indigenous communities across the country who are leading a resistance uh, in the climate movement, and climate change decolonization, cultural appropriation. We are here together at a fairly strange and disheartening moment in our nation's history where uh, the 45th president is staunchly denying that climate change is real and is actively implementing policies that would threaten the health and safety of all of us and the environment. But we are honored, though, tonight to be joined by a panel of native speakers, activists, academicians, and performers who are going to push us in our boundaries of thought and help us think about just solutions and to present some opportunities in what could be thought of as an environmental crisis. As you saw earlier this year, as thousands actually stood with, uh, in solidarity uh, against the Dakota Access Pipeline and millions, I mean tens of millions across the world, uh, we are really inherently entwined, intertwined with indigenous communities that are standing in the forefront of these issues. So we get to discuss tonight and make visible the representational issues, uh, indigenous rights issues, uh, and cultural appropriation. So I want to settle us in. Uh, tonight, our esteemed panelists are going to help us dig in, and our performers are going to help us dig in even more. And we want to paint a fuller picture of uh, ecological issues and what sovereignty is all about. So uh, now I would like to <laughs> uh, introduce uh, my friend Joanne Chase, uh, who is going to uh, introduce our performers for tonight. Thanks, Michelle. And good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. <clears throat> um, I'm really excited about tonight. I think it's just a wonderful opportunity um, that you're here is a testament to um, our collective commitment really to do all we can together, um, both individually and collectively, to ensure that we try to retain and maintain the safety and well-being of our Mother Earth. And so when Michelle first talked to me and said, I'm interested in maybe um, uh, having an Earth Day event with an indigenous lens, I was, I was like, this is so exciting. But let's not have it just be the conventional, somebody introduces somebody who introduces somebody who introduces somebody, even though Michelle just introduced me. And I will do a further <laughs> introduction. 
reflection <laughs> later. Right? Mm -hmm. And have it just be a, you know, a series of talking heads. Let's try to really think about this in terms of what helps to define um, an indigenous worldview and why that's so significant and why that's important. And so as expressive cultures, uh, we cannot uh, extrapolate uh, 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 our songs from the earth, our, uh, our medicines um, from the earth. It, it is every, things are very, very intertwined. Uh, and so I thought, what a wonderful opportunity to ask two people who I just really respect and adore, um, who are extraordinary gifted artists and who have used that talent to really help advance and educate uh, folks about Native issues and share that culture that's so important. So um, to get us started, if you will, in a good way, in a way that really brings, uh, clears the room, if you will, uh, and brings in the good energy and, um, and actually sets the appropriate tone for what I know is going to be a robust uh, exchange among this esteemed group of folks here, um, I'd like you to join me in welcoming Martha Redbone, um, a magnificent vocalist um, and playwright, I might add, who has a long and distinguished career, and her good friend and my good friend, Sonny Moreno, who also has an amazing distinguished career in the arts, but who together tonight are going to share with us some of the really um, the important uh, expression of culture that will be serve as the bookends of our discussion this evening. So with that, I'd like to ask Martha and Sunny to um, please join us. And I hope that you'll just give them a, a, a warm welcome. Good evening. <laughs> song that we're about to sing is called Immaculate Woman. It was inspired by a dream um, that I had uh, in Banff in Alberta. And it's a song that um, was inspired by a story that I was told from the people of the land that in Banff, before you go into the Rockies, there was a, a circle where the women got together um, with their families and uh, joined together in song and prayer before heading into their journey into the Rockies. So um, we'd like to do the song for you now. Prayer song. That yeah, you're it, able this, the to song. Stand. It would maybe we would ask that if you can stand, if you would stand, please, for this song. It's also a song of, of coming together and calling those that came before us and honoring them. So.
Thank you, Martha and Sonny. That was truly beautiful. Mm -hmm. I just have to be quiet for a moment and let that wash over me. Thank you. So now I really have the honor to be able to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have an amazing panel this evening. And uh, it's important, since we are at a place of knowledge, for you all to know who you will be engaging with over the course of the next hour and a half. So let me start off with uh, Patrick Rogers. So thank you very much, Patrick. Patrick uh, came to the EPA from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. At the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, he was director of, director of the office in Washington, DC, and was in charge of OHA's Federal Advocacy and Congressional Relations and Oversight of approximately $100 million in annual appropriations. Previous to OHA, Pat was at the Yale School of Management, where he was the inaugural director of the Executive Management Program for Tribal Leaders. He has been the Senior Advisor for Tribal Affairs, as well as the Chief of Congressional and Legislative Affairs for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Director of Policy for Governor Bill Richardson of New Mexico, Senior Policy Advisor for the U.S. Affiliated Pacific, Special Assistant of Administration for Native Americans, and as counsel to the U.S. Senate Indian Affairs Committee. How old are you? Pat <laughs> 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 holds a bachelor's degree from UH Manoa. Is that? That's correct. Thank you. And is a graduate of the University of New Mexico School of Law. Welcome, Patrick. Welcome, Pat. <laughs> so next distinguished panelist, is Jaskaran Dillon, one of our own faculty here. Jaskaran is a first-generation academic and advocate who grew up on the Treaty 6 Cree territory in Saskatchewan, Canada. Committed to the tenets of public intellectualism, Jaskaran's scholarship is intimately connected to and informed by on-the-ground advocacy and direct action. Her work spans the fields of settler colonialism, anthropology of the state, anti-racist and indigenous feminism, Youth Studies, Colonial Violence, and Indigenous Studies, and has been published in The Guardian, Cultural Anthropology, Truth Out, and many, many, many other venues. Her first book released in March 2017, which I think we're having a uh, book launch for very soon, uh, Prairie Rising, Indigenous Youth, Decolonization, and the Politics of Intervention, provides a critical ethnographic account of state interventions in the life of urban indigenous youth. Her new research focuses on developing an anti-colonial critique of the environmental justice movement by examining indigenous political movements working against the extractive industry, including the resistance at Standing Rock. Jess Guerin is an assistant professor of global studies and anthropology here at the New School and a member of the New York City Stands with Standing Rock Collective. Welcome, Jess Guerin.
Dr. Cecilia Martinez holds her PhD in Urban and Energy Planning from the University of Delaware, an MPA in Public Administration from Mexico State University, and a BA in Political Science from Stanford. She is a recognized expert in energy policy and climate equity, and has led a variety of projects to address sustainable development at the local and international levels. Dr. Martinez is the co-founder and director of the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy, and has been a faculty member at University of Delaware, Metropolitan State University, and is a visiting scholar at the Tishman Environment Design Center. Uh, she has served in the Climate Action Planning Steering Committee for the city of Minneapolis, the leadership team for the National EJ and Science in Initiative, and is leading the effort on a Truth and Reconciliation Commission on Environmental Harms. Among her many pub publications is a co-edited volume, Environmental Justice, Discourses in International Political Economy, which includes some of her work on Native American indigenous peoples and the challenge of forging a common agenda of indigenous rights, justice, and sustainability. Welcome, Cecilia Martinez. Yeah. Maya Lazara. Maya is a senior <laughs> at the New School. Yes. Hey. Here I am. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Studying culture and media with a minor in journalism and design. As an intern this semester with Human Rights Watch, Maya has worked on a variety of human rights issues and has been active in environmental organizing. A descendant of Cueca Incans from Altiplano, Bolivia, Maya has learned from a young age to take care of Pachamama, Mother Earth to be grateful for the harvest and to look out for the land and the food that comes from the land. Maya believes that life is a ceremony. She frequently participates in sweating ceremonies because she believes that sweating with Mother Earth is healing for both her and us. And if one wants to decolonize themselves, being with Mother Earth and praying to her and for her is the place we need to start. Welcome, Maya. And last but never least, <laughs> Joanne K. Chase. Uh, Joanne K. Chase is a visiting scholar with the Tishman Environment and Design Center and really is the lead organizer of tonight's event. So we thank Joanne so much. Prior to joining, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> thank you. Prior to joining the Tishman Center, Chase was the director of the American Indian Environmental Office at the US EPA. She holds a BA from Boston University and a JD from the University of New Mexico School of Law. A citizen of the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara nations, Joanne's role at the EPA was managing and directing issues related to the American Indian Environmental Office. She provided leadership, advice, and assistance on Indian affairs throughout the agency and across the federal government. Joanne has been serving as a social justice advocate and innovative strategist committed to building a more inclusive democracy. And she served in a range of leadership positions from the executive director for the National Congress of American Indian, this country's oldest and largest Indian membership organization, to serving as the director of the National Network of Grant Makers. She was also selected as a special rapporteur for Indigenous Caucus at the World Conference Against Racism. And she's <laughs> appeared before the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination as an expert, expert witness on indigenous issues. But that's the formal bio. I <laughs> love this woman. She is a fierce, 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 and tenacious advocate, uh, a real incredible practical legal and policy advisor and scholar. Uh, and a woman of intense principles. And I've learned so much from you, from her, during my time of knowing her. And I'm just so happy that she's here to be able to uh, work with us and to frame the discussion. And after Joanne's framing, uh, then we will get into our panel discussion, which I know you have all been waiting for. So, Joanne K. Chase. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's nice to look out in the audience and see some familiar faces, some longtime friends. And Maya, I'm so happy to have you on this panel. Um, and your participation is really critical to all of this. And it's an honor just to be sitting among such a distinguished group of people and to once again be um, 
participating in the continuation of the revolution with my good friend and colleague, um, Michelle DePass, because uh, we still need to be out there working really, really hard. So um, what we really want to do tonight, because this group is so, the knowledge runs so deep, and there's so much to talk about, and we want to also include the audience. We want to hear your comments, your questions, and have a, a dialogue to the extent possible. Um, what, I, what I wanted to do was just sort of provide an overarching frame um, so that people knew a little bit about, uh, had a little bit of a road map about where we want to go, because there's so much to talk about. You know, we could talk about energy policy all night long, and we could talk about decolonization all our lives, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we could talk about what we need to do in this political environment, and somehow in a short period of time, we're going to try to condense that conversation um, and, and involve you know, the genius of these folks and your input as well. And, and I hope at the end of the evening, what happens is that you leave with a sense of inspiration. I mean, thank you again to Sonny and Martha for starting us in a good way, for, for bringing us to that place to be reminded that we stand on the shoulders of generations who came before us and that we have a responsibility to those many generations that come after us. So um, I'm just really, again, so grateful that you were able to come and share that with everybody here and that you all take that as a gift as you leave too. But it also think be, that we think collectively. Um, the, the indigenous worldview, or as some folks have begun to refer to it as indi indigeneity, I still have trouble saying it, although I love the word, um, isn't, isn't, just for, isn't just for indigenous people. You know, it really is a view for all of us to embrace and practice. Um, and so what I wanted to do was start just quickly with a quick overview of, um, even though our conversation tonight will also transcend boundaries, we're really talking about indigenous peoples globally, just give some context for the complexity and diversity of tribal nations, even just in this country. Um, Michelle referred to my citizenship with the Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation. Uh, I grew up in a little community in Twin Buttes, North Dakota. Um, that is my home, and that's three tribes on one reservation, three different languages, three different, you know, three different practices of, of culture. Uh, there's matrilineal practices and patrilineal practices. My good friend here, Cecilia, comes from Taos Pueblo. Again, very, very different. Um, there's over 550. I can't remember the exact number now, Patrick. 567. 567 federally recognized tribes uh, in the United States alone. And that varies from really small villages in Alaska to large land-based tribes like the Navajo Nation, which is um, the largest in terms of land base to the Cherokee Nation, which currently is the largest in terms of population. So again, a tremendous diversity uh, among, our, among our communities and among our nations, and yet each, each nation is in fact a sovereign nation. So the larger tribe's sovereignty doesn't mean any more than the small village in Alaska. And that's what those are, that principle of sovereignty and self-determination are really, really critical, um, particularly here in the United States, to how tribes engage with, and, and, and importantly, how the federal government honors its obligations and responsibilities to tribes, uh, to tribal nations, and to their citizens. Uh, and so, you know, we have given this magnificent broad diversity. Sometimes there's this misnomer that we sit around together and sing kumbaya, right? We don't always do that because we are diverse and we disagree sometimes uh, on certain things and we may take different positions as tribes and that's okay, that's healthy um, and that is uh, um, something to be expected. The state of, uh, of New York isn't necessarily gonna do things the same way the state of California is. Or a county in New Mexico in the north may not be doing something the same way a county in New Mexico in the south is. Or Philadelphia isn't going to be doing something the same way San Francisco is, right? And so that tribes, we may read about divergence of, in a, of, of positions and opinions, and, 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 and that's to be expected. Um, and, and, and more often than not, um, what's appropriate and important to be reminded of that is that those disagreements are done in a way of respect, of mutual respect. And, and uh, understanding and appreciation of those differences. Um, but there are some things that we, since the beginning of time, have shared in common, irrespective of our differences. And these do transcend borders. This applies to indigenous peoples, I think, you know, across the globe. Um, and I, I think serves as a really important backdrop to these especially challenging times that Dean DePass referred to. We find ourselves in now. In fact, maybe the very um, survival of humanity depends on, on um, 
this, this world view. And I have to give credit to a wonderful friend and mentor of mine, a Comanche woman, LaDonna Harris, who many of you may know mm -hmm. some of the work of LaDonna and her leadership, um, who I think helped kind of distill down these complexities into um, what we call, or she calls, the four R's. So I'm going to give credit to, but also borrow from LaDonna tonight to kind of capture um, that which transcends our differences and transcends boundaries that have been imposed upon us. And really starting with um, uh, uh, the first R, which is relationships, you know, the kinships. Um, in the most profound sense, we're all related. Uh, and that humans are related to each other and to all things. And as Western scientists are really pretty much just now beginning to, to figure out um, that we and all matter um, are actually really literally the stuff of the stars. Um, and we've known that as indigenous peoples for a long time, that human beings, for example, have kinship with rocks and plants and animals and the earth. Um, and that concept of relationships includes absolutely the need to value each, each person, group, and element as an important part of the whole. Right? We can't talk about water without talking about the land, and we can't talk about our children without embracing our elders. And you know, we, we, the, we, we, don't, we can't separate into these nice little silos that seem that um, more conventional society would like us to separate ourselves into, that it really is uh, a, a whole. Um, and it's, I often refer to it as a tapestry you know, that is just so intricately and beautifully woven and that you can't pull a particular color or thread out of the tapestry, um, that it's important to see the tapestry as a whole. Um, there's the second R of responsibility and community, that we have a duty to care for our relatives, that each human is accountable for the well-being of their kin. Um, and if we call the earth our mother, then we have an obligation to care for her, right? Um, and we respect and recognize the impact that our lives uh, and how we live um, and the choices we make have on the natural and social environments. Um, we have a responsibility to use what we call our medicine, our internal strength and power. We all have that within us, right? Um, in strengthening our relationships and respecting and empowering um, our relatives, and again, our relatives aren't just our immediate family or our next door neighbor, they're also the animals and the plants and the living things. There's the R of reciprocity and interconnectedness and balance. So that our relationships and responsibilities shape uh, our roles in life and are reciprocal as in the nature of the universe uh, and, and all, all aspects of life. Our articulation and an understanding that all things are connected uh, and cyclical are fu and fundamental in knowing how we fit into the universe, community, and to our families. So reciprocity re represents cause and effect um, as we strive for balance. And we view leadership, in particular, as reciprocal as well, and a shared responsibility. Then there's the R of, re <clears throat> excuse me, of redistribution. I love this one. Because we live in a capitalist society that doesn't think about this very much, right? Um, and, and, and so what does redistribution mean? Well, it means generosity, right? Our reciprocal relationships and responsibilities guide us uh, to share our resources. Most, uh, most of the tribes in North America, uh, and this is probably true of indigenous peoples across the globe, really, um, had complex and sophisticated systems for the redistribution of wealth um, in order to maintain relatively flat mm. societies. So potlatches in the Northwest, you may have heard of those, or giveaways like where I come from on the Northern Plains if people travel a long distance. Um, they come to an event and the community actually comes together and, and acknowledges that and gives blankets and, and honors them for being in that space and, um, and for coming the distance that they have. Um, the Pueblos who have feast days and throws, right? And so there's these variety of really beautiful practices um, that are out there. Uh, the collective and communal, uh, tr communal traditions of our ancestors teach us that wealth must be shared for the greater good of the whole. Traditionally, one became a leader in part because of one's generosity and ability to care for relatives. Um, that's probably not true in the most recent election, right? No. And so in contemporary society, we can articulate redistribution as sharing of information, 
um, expertise, knowledge, and advocacy, um, and other resources you know, that we may have. And so, so I, I love kind of framing the, the, the overarching view with, within the context of those four R's. And so we know that the community-based value system, which I've just really talked about, often clashes with, um, within, with, with individual <coughs> basis, with the individual kind of uh, value system that dominates in a capitalist society that we live in. So let me use just like a couple of examples to help make this a little bit more real. So let's talk about traditional ecological knowledge, which is a, a term of art. Um, uh, of course, I worked in the federal government. We have acronyms for everything, so it's T-E-K, right? <laughs> but but um, this, is, this, uh, this is an example as it relates to, to climate change. You know, our um, elders for years, for decades, have been talking about um, things that they see, changing patterns in the migration of animals, um, the, the way that, the way a plant smells from one season to the next, um, as an example, um, how, the, how the winds change and, and blow differently. Um, you know, they, they have looked at the waters and the waves to predict years ago that we were going to face challenges of permafrost melt, for example, in Alaska. Um, and so, um, um, you know, what has happened, though, is that we've had um, Western science generally wholly reject the idea of traditional knowledge in any sort of decision making um, and, it, and until really very recently. And, and it's quite been encouraging, I have to say, to see some of the attempts to, uh, it, to involve uh, TEK in, in, in the decision making appropriately. But we face a couple of challenges, right? So on the one hand, it's often been wholly rejected and dismissed as sort of goofy mumbo jumbo. Or it's been co-opted, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody else takes it and says, all right, we're going to make this ours. And they don't maintain the kind of appropriate respect that, they sh that, that what one should have for the tribes. Um, and sometimes with, with, with good intentions and sometimes with not good intentions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's been appropriated, right? And so we, what we need to do is continue to strive to find the balance in this um, where that kind of knowledge is respected and used at the behest of the tribe, because it really will help, or the nation, um, or the community, or the clan that may be, um, may be advancing uh, traditional ecological knowledge as one way to, um, to be, again, to help bridge you know, this divide that's in place. Um, recently, we've heard a great deal about, about water. I was telling Michelle, I'm really happy. The one, there's a lot of things liberating about leaving the federal government. And that's not to say that I wasn't honored to serve. <laughs> but you can now talk about things that you weren't necessarily supposed to talk about because your press office was supposed to talk about them or your congressional affairs office was supposed to talk about them. But now when you're on the outside, you get to be like, you can talk about it all, you know, and say. So um, we, we had issues like the Gold King Mine Spill that I'm sure many of you read about in, in the, uh, the newspapers. Um, the Dakota Access Pipeline, which has been a heartbreaking journey for many of us. Um, on the one hand, it was so encouraging to see people, as Dean DePass referred to, uh, from across the globe offer their support. And on the other hand, with the sweep of a pen, we now see the continuation of this pipeline and a total desecration of sacred sites and, um, and, and the sacred water of uh, the Standing Rock people and others affected by this. And so um, there's, there's a real frustration uh, and and uh, and I want to you know beyond frustration. There's a deep sense of betrayal uh, as we've watched mm -hmm. this continue to progress. Um, and we know the incredible significance of water to indigenous peoples. I mean, very simply stated, um, water's life, right? Um, and it's sacred. Um, and yet, indigenous peoples, if we're using water as an example, um, from around the globe, have been forced, if you will, to formulate innovative and powerful responses to contamination, the exploitation and theft of water, um, as we've been silenced uh, or dismissed by genocidal schemes reproduced through legal, corporate, and I have to say academic means. You know? um, and so this raises really significant issues about the what, what self-determination and what sovereignty really mean. And so um, I'm really excited to have Professor Dillon here um, joining us to give some insights on uh, the effects of, of, of colonialism and, and um, you know, how deep its roots are and how destructive of force it is and what we can do, not as individuals, but also what we can do collectively to shift that paradigm 
and to move away and to really advance some advanced change. Um, and so we can't sit in this room and have a conversation without also talking about the current state of politics and policy uh, in this country. And I have to just make a personal note here. Um, I was, as I say, very grateful to have served uh, in the Obama administration um, as a presidential appointee. But when Dean DePass first called me and asked me if I would be interested in coming to Washington, I was like, you have lost your mind. Because <laughs> there is no way, given my career, ever, 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 under any circumstance, am I actually going to consider uh, a career in the federal government. In fact, as much as I love you, Michelle, then Assistant Administrator Michelle, my real job is actually to make your job more difficult, <laughs> right? And hold your feet to the fire as a federal <laughs> official. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, and we had a series of conversations, but well, I really saw an opportunity uh, to, to work from within mm -hmm. and, to, and, and in the spirit of an administration that really embraced true partnership with tribes and recognized tribal sovereignty and wanted to work to advance um, self-determination of tribal nations particularly within the context of the environment for me, um, I thought, okay, this is, this is an opportunity to go try to create change from a different angle, from within the federal government as a federal employee. And I have to say I'm really very proud of the work that we were able to do um, because it was advancing that true partnership. It was the President of the United States himself really understanding and respecting self-determination and tribal sovereignty within an imperfect circumstance. You know, as I, I, I say, I'm proud of the work that EPA did, but there's still flaws. There's flaws within the federal system and flaws within the government that we all need to continue to advance but, uh, and, and seek to change. Um, and, but we work to do that, I think, in real meaningful ways inside of, of EPA. And so, um, you know, breaking down some of those silos and streamlining lining processes to make it easier for tribes to actually, tribal nations to, to manage their own environmental uh, programs, to make decisions on their own behalf, not the well-intentioned decisions of the EPA, but the decisions and priorities of the tribe <laughs> themselves and how they are going to provide for their citizens. Um, we actually um, made great progress on treaty rights, which I think scared a whole lot of the federal family. Um, but treaty rights are the law, supreme law of the land, and for the agency itself to come up with a mechanism by which we would consider and give honor to tribal treaty rights um, in certain decision making was an, was an amazing step forward in the right direction. And of course, that wasn't without significant consultation and input um, from the tribes themselves. Um, I made reference to traditional ecological knowledge, and let me just say straight up, EPA was a guilty partner in this. We thought, okay, this is really wonderful. We want to use traditional knowledge in our decision making, and this is how we're going to do it. Well, that's not how it works. The tribes have to be at the table. They have to be there. It's the, the folks, uh, uh, and, and sometimes not even just the leadership, but sometimes the actual practitioners themselves. Um, there are, there are um, practices that can't be talked about. There are sacred, um, sacred practices in some of the traditions. Um, so we had to figure out how, you, how, do you, how do you respect that? It's, it's imperative to do that. So, you know, good intentions in this instance notwithstanding, and let's be clear, there's bad intentions elsewhere too. But, you know, how do we take a step back and really ensure that the decision makers are, in fact, the tribes um, themselves on behalf of their citizens? Um, we embrace citizen science. You know, it's really exciting. When I'll, I'll just make a note. Um, there's a wonderful program uh, that you can download called LEAL, Local Environmental Observers. We've used it in Alaska. We're now replicated it in the Northwest, which gives people an opportunity to record observations in real time. And then those are, you know, uh, whatever, however the systems and however technology analyzes those and tracks those have been really helpful in trying to understand some of the impacts, particularly of climate change um, in Alaska, where it may be very remote, um, certainly along the north um, west coast, where we've seen tremendous challenges in terms of salmon runs. And I think this kind of information is now being replicated in other indigenous communities in the world, um, right now even in Scandinavia. Um, and then, as I said, to make sure that the voice is really at the table, that that partnership is an authentic one. Um, and so uh, it was really exciting for me to see tribal leadership not only have an opportunity to advocate on behalf of issues of concern to the tribe, but to be at the table as experts when it comes to, came to issues like um, 
Puget Sound and trying to create a, a healthy system within Puget Sound. Um, the uh, Bristol Bay, um, how do we maintain those pristine places? Uh, and, and again, tribes, really key uh, decision makers at the table. Um, and the Great Lakes, um, the Great Lakes restoration, of, of the, the, the expertise and input of the tribes was essential in that. And it's uh, been pretty discouraging to, to see some of those initiatives absolutely zeroed out in the current budget requests that are um, now going to be going forward to Congress. Um, and then we did the, we developed the tribal. Okay. Yes, yeah, we are. So thank you. <laughs> right? <laughs> no, hey, thank you. That was a really good reminder here. So, and then, uh, then, in, then there's the environmental um, justice um, issues. So, not only is there an opportunity to try to deal appropriately and honor and respect tribal governments and tribal leadership that are serving their citizens, but there's, well, there's also tremendous movement amongst tribal citizens groups, you know, who also uh, need to have a voice, whether it's in an urban area like Albuquerque, or it's, um, it's, a, it's a, a within their own tribe, right? Like my tribe, for example, where the government's making decisions on development, and the citizens groups have been e very powerful and essential as a voice there. So I'm, I'm delighted that Patrick, who is currently working at the Environmental Protection Agency, has been brave enough to say, I'm coming out and I'm going to speak truth to power and tell it like it is of what we're dealing with here. And Cecilia, with the policy work that you've done, particularly in the, in the world of, of energy, you know, uh, help remind us of what we can do as individuals and what we can do collectively to embrace um, alternative sources of, and renewable energy sources, right? And so it's in that spirit of, of this conversation um, that um, I'm, I'm excited to hear your expertise. And then Maya, for you as a student, every single part of this conversation is relevant, and your, your voice is probably the most critical one here. So thank you for taking the time to participate, um, and I'm looking forward to you know, having the input and, and hearing from each person on the panel, and then, as we said, uh, entertaining some questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. thank you, Joanne. I asked Joanne to give sort of a keynote to bring us into the room, mm -hmm. and it is very important for all of us, I think as you talk about respect, for all of us to respect the knowledge and the information mm -hmm. that is being brought in, in the time that it's being brought in. So I really want to thank, thank Joanne you. for that. <laughs> thank you. So now we get to dig in, now we get to dig in. And you know, as I, so I read formal bios, right, but, what I would love for us as, as we're starting is for you all to bring us a little bit into um, the places that either your work or and or the places that you grew up um, that, uh, you know, I've been really lucky enough to travel in, um, around Indian country in the lower 48 and Alaska and just the memories and how uh, Indian country has been shared with me. I would love for you to share uh, some of what you know and and who you are with with uh, the audience here. So let's let's start with Patrick. If you could just give us a couple minutes to bring us into what you know and you know where you grew up and where you call home. Um, I'm from Hawaii originally, so um, my perspective of Native people um, is certainly formed um, from living in an island in the Pacific. I'm native Tahitian. Um, the thing that kind of strikes me uh, about this is when we talk about social justice, um, one needs to first identify the legal construct in which tribes operate in the, in the US at least. And we operate from this perspective of what they call the federal trust rel relationship. Um, and so to simplify it, in many ways the federal government is overseeing Indian country in what they call the government to government relationship, which at first blush kind of um, alludes to parity, but it's not, it, there's not a parity. It is a parental to child kind of relationship, and they, many cases, talk about it in, in such a way. And so when we talk about social justice, this relationship allows us to speak government to government, but because of that, 
it creates this feature in that many of the individual voices of what I call Indian country are lost because our responsibility um, is to the government. And so we're always coming on this plane of government to government, mm -hmm. but we're missing the individuals. And so from an environmental social justice perspective, that's really lost. And from my culture to even Lakota, they have a concept of called Ikse Wishkasha, the common man. Everything we do, any kind of education or position I hold um, must be held back to that, that person that is most pedestrian in our society, but also a mentality of what is that nexus, despite me being in this position, of how this person feels. And so there's a disparity, um, and that disparity is real. Um, and I think that in these last kind of seminal events like Dakota Access, we've really seen that um, because these individuals um, are, are, are crying out, not just the tribes themselves. And so it, it is another kind of complexity uh, on this veneer of the native relationships from the US that um, challenges us. And I have to say, um, I, I'm here, I am in, um, still an EPA employee, um, and so I'm not speaking on behalf of EPA or on the administration. And in fact, I'm, as I always joke, I'm institutionally petulant. Um, <laughs> I am there to be a burrow in someone's ass. And, <laughs> and it's because of people like Joanne. Joanne and I are law school classmates, and so um, we, we have a long history in that. But I, I think that's a good foray into the initial kind of um, complexion in, in which we have tribal relationships in the U.S. and the many issues before us. Thank you, Patrick. Yes, Karen. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about you know, where you grew up and what you have seen? Um, I, so I just like, would like to start by thanking uh, Michelle and Joanne for bringing this together and also Molly for doing a bunch of the logistics and background Yay, work. Molly. <laughs> Um, and to recognize that we're here on Lenape territory at the new school as well in Lenape Hoking. Um, and to thank you, Joanne, for your opening remarks and for helping us situate in um, the conversation and providing an overview and getting us started. Um, so I am the daughter of immigrant parents. I grew up on Treaty 6 Cree territory in Saskatchewan. So my entry to the world of settler colonialism and colonialism and questions about indigenous politics and rights and sovereignty come from the vantage point of a settler, a settler of color who, as I said, was um, born and raised on the plains of central Canada, so just about eight hours north of Standing Rock, North Dakota. And so most of my life, I would say the last two decades, I've spent thinking about how to work in politicized allyship with indigenous nations across a range of communities. The most familiar to me are Cree and Métis because that's the territory that I grew up on. Um, and so most of my work, both as a scholar and um, a writer and as an advocate and organizer and educator as well, has focused on um, deepening my understanding of what it means to live on this land um, in a good way, um, in a way that respects and honors the, um, the people whose land upon which these um, countries were built. Um, and to do that with respect and integrity. Um, so I've been very fortunate to have spent a great deal of time um, learning from my indigenous comrades, a host of incredible indigenous organizers and intellectuals whose work informs mine, and from amazing indigenous students who sit in my classrooms. Um, so I, yeah, so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have the new school sort of beginning to open up to these kinds of conversations. It's been a long run for some of us here, so we're happy to see it happening. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll just stop there. I can talk more about my work after. Thank you. Cecilia. Well, first of all, thank you. And thank you, Joanne, very much for those opening remarks. Um, where do I come from? I come from a place in New Mexico in the northern mountains. Um, it's a place called Taos now. Um, Taos, if you all are familiar, is roughly about 45 miles away from Los Alamos, New Mexico, um, where the most destructive weapon on the planet was researched 
and developed. Um, that's a very oxymoronic way of growing up in the world. Um, to grow up um, in an indigenous community that values life, um, that values all life, um, that understands and has grown through the years and through the generations of listening to not only each other with patience, um, because that's critically important. Oftentimes in this world, I think we are so used to the conventional way of speaking and um, having people get to a particular point um, mm -hmm. around some issues that um, the indigenous way is much different. The indigenous way is a patient way. It's a respectful way. And everyone who is speaking, their words are coming from their heart. And their words are sacred. So we honor the sacredness of what people are saying. We also understand that life all around us speaks to us. They don't have the English language, but our relatives, the four-legged, the winged ones, the ones that swim, they have a knowledge and they have a history and it is our role to respect that and also to learn from them and, and, and learn their lessons. Um, so I grew up that way and I've been very lucky also to live in the Midwest with the Ojibwe and Dakota people and have had just incredible elder mentors who, as Joanne was saying, um, never went to formal school and yet could tell you intricately about the changes that are happening in the ecosystem, not in scientific terms, but if you listen patiently, you will hear and you will understand the changes that are going on in the world around them. That is a gift to be able to listen to that and it's something I think we all need to learn. Contrast that with the world of the atomic bomb that was just up the mountain where science was used actually for destructive purposes. Mm -hmm. And that for me was really the focal point of what it meant to grow up as an indigenous woman in a world that doesn't, where knowledge doesn't respect life. And that has sort of guided me this whole, my whole life as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Maya, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, um, I wanted to begin by thanking you all by um, sitting here and also everyone in the audience. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, wanted to thank everyone for sitting with, um, sitting with each other today, and to Jazz, um, a professor who invited me, well, I, yeah, to come up here, and I really appreciate the <laughs> everyone coming out here today and sharing the knowledge. Um, my name is Maya, I'm a senior here still, and I um, grew up in Lenape territory. Um, I like to Jazz, um, my parents, um, were settlers of color immigrants, but indigenous. Um, my father's indigenous to um, Altiplano Bolivia, East Quechua. Um, so my people from Andes, my mom is from Argentina. And um, growing up, though I grew up um, in the Napa territory, which now is New York City, called New York City, um, I um, had um, the, I guess, blessing, the being fortunate of going back to where, um, my, where my people are from, see my family in the Andes. So between South America and here, and just knowledge from both being embraced um, in, and becoming family with also indigenous people of Turtle Island. Um, my mom was adopted by um, Ho uh, Dene Hopi family. So, um, I had growing up knowledge from from both from south and north. Yeah. I'm here. Yes, you are. Thank you. And and about to graduate, right? Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> so um, I'd I'd love to dig in, particularly right now with uh, Jess and Maya, um, because I really Jess's work right now is 
very much centered on uh, colonialism and uh, lifting up the work of indigenous youth uh, and uh, being able to uh, interweave that with a, a lot of different uh, uh, disciplines out there, one of them being environmental justice. So um, I'd love for you to be able to bring us a little bit into that work so that we can talk a bit about um, the future, the future generations and, and, and hope. It'd be great to talk a little bit about hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want me to start or do you want Maya to start? I, I'm asking you to start. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so I became interested in questions of obviously environmental justice and climate change several years ago as most of us sort of began to read and think more critically and deeply about how our world was changing beyond um, our control and also thinking a lot about the generations that were to come and I have a, a soon to be 18 year old daughter mm -hmm. who is also really active in the environmental justice movement and I was beginning to like really notice how her pro political vernacular and orientation to the climate justice movement was being oriented and positioned in a certain way and so I really wanted to, to help sort of to push her a little bit to think deeper about that and to really to center it within sort of the larger landscape of indigenous politics and um, knowledge. And so I started looking closely at how different kinds of movements were sort of organizing around environmental justice issues. And because I have a long standing history of working with indigenous youth, of course, um, they were the first people that I went to to sort of begin thinking about these questions. And what's so important and striking, and I think so absolutely urgent and necessary, is that their work targets environmental justice, organizes around environmental justice, but does so by targeting colonialism first. Mm -hmm. And so it really, it, it forces us to sort of contend with what it means to have arrived in this place of massive environmental destruction um, and the linkages between that and a long-standing history of colonialism and capitalism that has been, um, you know, that has unleashed a kind of never-ending desire for more energy regardless of the cost. And so I listened to them. I watched what they were doing. Um, I had, you know, the opportunity to meet so many amazing young people, Cree, um, um, Athabasca Cree around Fort McMurray and the Tar Sands. Mm -hmm. Um, many, many Lakota, Dakota Sioux youth around that were organizing around Standing Rock and then also in British Columbia and various places. Um, and they were thinking about these questions in different ways. So water didn't just, wasn't positioned as a resource, it was positioned as kinship, mm -hmm. right? A struggle for justice around the Dakota Access Pipeline was also a struggle about poverty, also a struggle around the violation of treaty rights, also a struggle around colonial gender violence enacted against indigenous women and girls, also a story about what extractive industries brought to their communities. And so they were thinking about environmental politics as justice, a justice in a broader decolonial sense, really thinking about how the ongoing indigenous dispossession of indigenous homelands was intimately linked with the state's ability to continue to engage in these kinds of extractive processes. Um, they move with brilliance, they move with bravery, they move with courage, they take risks, they organize, they support one another, and often set against pretty extreme levels of deprivation and marginalization. You know, they're dealing with a tremendous amount of ongoing structural state violence that can be seen in everything from, you know, the criminalization and incarceration of youth to poor educational funding, so high dropout rates and a whole range of other things that, that they're sort of, and the ongoing, of course, legacy and trauma of boarding school and residential schooling. So. Um, it's a pretty incredible and inspiring space to be around. Um, and I think it, it is probably the strongest window into what's possible um, for us in terms of ongoing resistance. Maya, uh, what are your reflections on that? And where do, where do you think uh, there is some hope in terms of the space of being a young person uh, in this movement? I think there, well, let me think about it. I think there's hope in being comfortable and being loud and resisting. And I've been thinking a lot about, I guess, the question that you were asking me in the beginning, or kind of like the introduction. <coughs> and I wanted to talk about 
I wanted to bring up, of course, um, the Kodak's pipeline in Standing Rock and how it was called um, prayer, like prayer camps. And I think that we, um, we should also shouldn't be afraid to call them resistance camps. And I think there, there's hope in, in reclaiming that and reclaiming resistance. And I know the history of indigenous people, both North and South, of course, being called savages, being called violent, and um, through the conquistadores and through like in just through colonial colonization, but I think that for me, I see hope in in being young and being proud of of being unapologetically indigenous. And and yes, they were prayer camps, but there also was direct action, which is absolutely necessary. <coughs> and and yes, there was self defense resistance, and I think that the hope is is there in in being unashamed of, of praying and of practicing our traditions, but of also being unashamed and unapologetic in, in um, declaring what's rightfully ours, which is you know, so much land. Indigenous, this is all indigenous land. And I think that um, I see a lot of hope among young people when they realize that what was taken from them um, also people who are indigenous to Africa, when I see um, in, you know, not just like native from North and South, but black people like realizing what's rightfully theirs and what was taken. And I think there's a lot of hope in that and that realization and, and that um, we can do it while praying, of course, with love and with patience. I really loved what you said, Cecilia, about patience. And I forget that too a lot of times, but I think it's, it's important um, not to uh, to be afraid of, of showing that. And I see hope in that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I, the young, I, I wanna follow you because that's exactly where I think we should be. It has been amazing uh, since the inauguration, uh, the resistance that we have seen, people being comfortable with being each other, we, around each other. Mm -hmm. you know, those that have been long time LGBTQ activists standing next to those that are standing for Black Lives Matter <clears throat> and everybody standing outside this, this building uh, during one demonstration, you know, shouting and, and activating around Standing Rock. And so it has, um, we are learning. We are learning mm -hmm. from the young people who are looking at at the intertwining of all these. So speaking of why resistance is, has always been critical, but is so critical right now. Um, <coughs> so uh, we mentioned that our 45th president is pretty determined on undoing many of the gains that we have made uh, and reversing some of the really important things that uh, we're not only important in terms of protection of human health and environment, but also really important in terms of our morals and our values. You know, uh, stopping the Keystone Pipeline and, you know, stopping the Code Access Pipeline. And just now, it's, you know, the floodgates have opened with many, 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 many reversals. So, so let's talk a little bit about the policy landscape and uh, where we are today and, um, and uh, what do you see as really important elements for policy and politics across Indian country today uh, where we sit? So I am going to start out with Cecilia and ask her <laughs> to start out. <laughs> policy uh, in the Trump era. Um, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> So um, I want to. I might. I might try and build that off of what has already been said because I think, I think this this point of the youth, the strength that the youth bring right now. We must not also forget that their strength has a lineage. If mm -hmm. we think about it, that the kind of colonization that happened over the course of 500 years, but let's just focus on the last 100 or 200 mm -hmm. of intentional mm -hmm. policy mm -hmm. 
to kill the Indian and save the man, mm -hmm. to take youth from their families, dragging them from their families, to put them in boarding schools to civilize them, to make illegal native traditional practices, to take the land and redefine what that ecosystem is in the service of profit. That's something that we have already experienced. And we are still here. And we are still resisting. And we are still enabling language, trying to eradicate native languages. So I think the strength that the youth are showing now is a testament to the elders who actually had to withstand and hide, hide their drums, hide that they were speaking their language in order that the language would still stay alive, hide all those things so that it could resurface again. And so I think what we are experiencing now in the Trump era is those same kinds of policies. Maybe it's not boarding schools and maybe it's not the eradication of language, but they are just as decimating to our people and to all our relatives, black, white, um, brown relatives. So what do we need to do? I think we need to actually begin to um, figure out how to work together. I think there's been a schism between mainstream environmentalism mm -hmm. and those of us who work in the environmental justice or indigenous world. Um, that is a critically important thing, that we have to start bringing justice at the forefront of all of our work. Mm -hmm. Um, we can do it, I'm, I, I, I know that we can, and I think that resistance in the policy world is gonna have to translate, we're gonna have to re-strategize how we engage the federal, um, we don't have you any longer, we don't have Michelle DePasses and Joanne Chase, we don't have Lisa Jacksons in, in EPA, obviously, we have coal industry <laughs> in EPA. Um, um, we need to come together and re-strategize what those policies are. And we have already been doing that. We know what the right policies are. I think it's now how do we figure out how to bypass these structural um, problems and, or structural barriers and really work together to push from the bottom up. I don't know the answer how we deal with, with Trump. I just know that we have a vast experience of already doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think if we just put that knowledge and experience to practice once again, which we are doing, we're, it's, it's gonna be a long haul, but we're gonna be continue to do the work no matter what is in front of us. Mm -hmm. well, Patrick, there's a, a values, and I bring you in here as your day-to-day -day work, and as you say, I, I can't remember the word you used, that you are every day, was it agitator or? Oh. But there's a cultural <laughs> and values conversation that you know, I know that you know is incredibly important that you, you know, bring to your work. Uh, could you talk a little bit about you know, from where you sit, um, what you think about uh, bringing in that cultural and values perspective to be able to uh, move forward a optimistic policy future? From where I sit, the, the first thing I would state that all Native people, we have inherent volition and autonomy. So despite the, what the landscape is, we need to have that core value that we have always had this ability to decide for ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, many um, things in this current landscape um, um, we operate from a, a quantitative basis. Mm -hmm. And what's most appalling is most public policy is evidence-based, data-driven, and best practice. Mm -hmm. And we have a complete dearth of that right now. Nary a, a fact is, is given to propositions. And so this, the benefit of the, its economic or its productivity is an, the antithesis of, of, of of what native people do, because ours is not one of output or productivity of the land, it is stewardship. If we take care of the land, the land will take care of you. And there's a reciprocal relationship with that. Um, but I, I do go back to the, these elements of, of what 
I think, are cultural and moral precepts to all of us, um, and especially for Native people. I, I live from a, a, a kind of an idiom, um, aloha mai no aloha aku. When love is given, it must be returned. But this is not some cliche Oprah Winfrey kind of um, <laughs> aphorism of the day. It is a mature that everything that I've been put in this place, I have a responsibility for those that are coming up, like this young lady, mm -hmm. which really endears me, mm -hmm. to the elders that brought us along our way. Mm -hmm. So when we are in this space, right, we have an obligation for our community, and that community then extends to this region and then this global um, portion of it. And it, all of it, it operates from these basic kinds of tenets like generosity, integrity, love, compassion, empathy. These are the same kinds of things that we feel about the land. And so while others may put it in a kind of a more highfalutin vernacular of conservation, ours is we provide for this so we can hand it down to this next generation. And hopefully it's in better shape. And, and, and it's as easy as that. In, in this particular environment, we have to fight though. Um, th there is no other kind of adjective that adequately describes what we are up against. Um, so what I would say to that is look internal. Uh, and much of that, if we're silent and we listen to ourselves, we know what to do. Um, and I think for me, um, aside from all of the, the science around it, th those are the things that provide the impetus and motivation to kind of go forward. Thank you, Patrick. So we may not have Lisa Jackson or Joanne or Michelle, but we have you. <laughs> and we have several others like you and many like you still in the you know, agency. I, so. I, I just wanted to take a second. You mm -hmm. know, the, this, this notion of colonization, it goes back 800 years from the doctrine of discovery. Mm -hmm. It is the reason why one half the world spoke Spanish and the other half spoke Portuguese. But it was also based on this premise, if you do not think these indigenous people are utilizing their land mm -hmm. in a way that you think is the mm -hmm. most appropriate or the maximum utilization, you can take their lands. Mm -hmm. This then went forward another five, six hundred years and was the remnant of manifest destiny. So the, the, the two societies most affected by colonization are agrarian societies and native people because they're basically one and the same. And these things are still lingering today because of these decisions of the Vatican in the 13th century. And so we are still dealing with much of the ramifications of what you just spoke to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, I want to uh, take it to a different aspect of our society. So we're at the New School. The New School has uh, a lot of incredible scholars and practitioners. And uh, many of them are uh, engaged in design, uh, uh, fashion, uh, moving forward opportunities to, the, to do either uh, artisanal or manufacturing of, of, of products and ideas. And um, I wanted to get a little bit into the discussion and the thinking about um, cultural appropriation and um, uh, a design. Uh, it, it, it is something that occurs in our space often over and over and over again and um, I wanted to uh, unpack that a little bit in terms of um, uh, the discussion that is happening in Indian country around uh, cultural appropriation and uh, and you know our our product services and, and design. Uh, Joanne, I'm gonna turn to you to start us off a little bit there with sure. that and then turn to Travis. Well, and it builds on the, so much of what we've been, what we've been mm -hmm. discussing. I mean, if you go back to the notion that like this country is built on stolen labor of slaves and the stolen land of the indigenous people, you know, the, the manifestation continues into the right to just take you know, this is, and so if, if Ralph Lauren 
can take a design and put it on sheets, that's fine, you know, without respect for folks. It's, it's part of the extension of the, and I don't, I'm not suggesting it's fine, but it, there's this practice that, that happens um, that we've seen over and over and over, whether it's um, in, in the fashion industry itself, right? Um, it's in, uh, well, it's, it's homeware, it's music, my goodness, you know, um, um, it's other, it's sacred practices. Um, we've seen the cultural appropriation of, of traditional practices in a way that's extremely inappropriate and disrespectful. But I think it really is an extension of this notion that, um, that what is indigenous is okay to just take, whether it's our land, um, our design, in some ways attempts to take our spirituality, certainly our food. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I but am, however, encouraged by, um, you know, by the, the, the continuing desire of all of us to work better together and to understand um, better together and to build stronger alliances. You know, part of what's happened is that we ourselves, as people of color, um, as oppressed people, have been marginalized and siloed, right? And so, for a long time, you know, I remember growing up, if you, if you were a dark-skinned Native person, you had to either be black or Indian, you couldn't be both, you know? I mean, nobody could, somebody, you couldn't be um, Mexican and, and Apache, you know? I mean, somewhere, somehow, uh, the, the societies, you know, we were, we were forced to make choices. And then, and then, you know, we ended up in sort of what we sometimes refer to sometimes as, you know, the, uh, in, in more contemporary times, the, um, the Olympics of oppression, right? Mm -hmm. And we work against each other. So, oh my gosh, the black community suffers this way, and the native community suffers this way, and, you know, and, and we don't, we, we in some ways, because of these manifestations of, of colonization and the history of how this country has been built, we've been, we've been isolated in some ways from each other. And one of the things that I really love about young people um, and the movement and the power of the young people is that they are so transcending those differences. And there's all kinds of explanations, the boarded school explanations. This isn't anybody's particular fault that generations before us didn't always work well together. I mean, we, you know, we were experiencing, um, Native people were experiencing termination and assimilation um, as the civil rights movement was advancing. You know, and so there's, there's all this discord, but to see now you know, young people who are raising awareness and understanding that, that all of this works together, that how we work to protect the environment, how we raise awareness, how we engage with respect for each other, how we leverage our relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, cultural appropriation in the world of fashion isn't limited to designs being stolen from indigenous peoples. Here, look at what's happened with the Maasai in Kenya, you know, and, and major fashion houses. Um, um, receiving zillions of, of dollars in profits mm -hmm. off that, while the Maasai themselves receive nothing. You know? mm -hmm. So uh, to going, you know, going back to, 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 to what's exciting and powerful about seeing younger people um, is that I see them really building on that knowledge that um, folks who've come before us have mm -hmm. put and that experience, but also taking it and making it their own and transcending that, those differences and really um, working in a way that's more visionary and more collective. Um, and that to me is really exciting and really powerful because it all is interrelated. Mm -hmm. Jeff, do you wanna add anything uh, here? Well, I think Joanne said it very well. <laughs> I mean, I will just, I, one, one or two things I can think of to add are partly what is the responsibility of institutions like the New School to do the pedagogic work right. of teaching in the curriculum and in the practice of manufacturing and production, not just around fashion and design, but around a whole host of um, you know, disciplinary areas. So I really take to heart the, the role of, the critical role of an educator mm -hmm. in thinking about you know, who it is that you're participating in producing in your classrooms. So that's part of the question, uh, or part of the, the sort of one piece of the puzzle. Um, I also think that in this kind of appropriation, there's a commodification and consumption that has a long history, as you said, Joanne. You know, it's playing the Indian, it's consuming the parts that are tenable, that are that are that seem like they're you know trendy and cool. You know, urban outfitters. There's mm -hmm. any number of examples of this. But I would also say, you know, there's also amazing critical work that's being done in opposition to that by, you know, incredible indigenous artists and designers. You know, um, I think about Jessica Medcalf and Beyond Buckskin. Mm -hmm. You know, Adrian Keene has a blog called Native Appropriations that really tracks 
the way um, you know indigenous culture is consumed and commodified in the mainstream fashion industry. Um, you know, there are incredible artists here in New York City, indigenous artists that are really, I think, doing very critical work to push the boundaries of fashion and industry and the arts in ways that um, is making a mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, could, I, could I build off of what of you all said? Because I think uh, um, both these ideas are really, uh, one thing that I think is really important to talk um, to students about those in fashion is that when they see an image or a concept that is indigenous that seems visually um, appealing and something to take and sort of make better, what is not understood, that that's just the end of an intricate process of ceremony, of practice, of cultural tradition. The journey in, in, in indigenous practice is as important as the end, which is the ultimate product. And I think mainstream society not seeing that process, beading, um, designs, those are not just, um, I don't know, images. They, are rep they represent something very important that's part of a cultural practice. Mm -hmm. And if you don't understand that cultural practice, you're, you're actually missing the whole meaning mm -hmm. of what that visual representation mm -hmm. is. And then the second part, I think, is, and that goes to the commodification and the appropriation. And I think the second part is really important to understand is whatever it is produced, the life cycle of that product is as important. We talk about generations. We talk about, and this is not cliche, we talk about how we understand our actions today impacting seven generations. So if you're creating something, if the fashion industry is creating something, how does that product affect workers, relatives? How, does it, how will it impact seven generations from now? Mm -hmm. That's not an archaic notion. It's actually a principle that we should be operating in something now that is talked about in terms of sustainability, mm -hmm. yes. but it's a practice that indigenous people have a principle that has been in operation for a while. Thank you. I wanna open it up for uh, some questions uh, before we go back to our panelists and also our performers. So there's an <coughs> opportunity for you all, don't be shy, to raise your hand and jump in and the conversation. So, who has, Jean? I want to thank you for coming. And I think I can speak for many people here that I feel a personal pain from what you're saying. And I think it comes from understanding that we are all born from stardust, we all evolved from the earth. So I keep trying to reach for something that, when you say work together, includes everybody. And I think it's, it's extremely important for us in our resistance not to continue the polarization that has brought us to this moment. I can't say to you that I know what that means to you personally. I know what it means to me because I think it's very important to recognize your hurt in a very specific cultural way and to seek the causes of it, for instance, in appropriation. So I'm putting in a plea for understanding that working together and resisting actually means, I think, not only that we're all victims, but we're all murderers. Mm -hmm. And until we can really take that to heart, we're gonna continue to polarize. And I don't think anybody wants the consequences of that today, given the powerful weapons formed near mm -hmm. Taos and the other side of it, that the earth is evolving away from what it is now. Mm -hmm. 
And I really think we have to pay attention to that. We have to in, really align ourselves. I, I know that from actual experience. That is telling us something. And if we don't align with it, rather than intervening, I think a lot of what we value in the things that you're talking about will be gone. Mm -hmm. So I just want to hopefully tell you how painful it is to hear what you're saying. And I agree that we have to work together. But I think the together has to be all forms of life, which include the capitalists, the consumers, which includes us. So thank you. Thank you. What I learned to see from Jean to align and work together. Uh, question, comments in the audience. It's wonderful getting the mic that way. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about cooperation. Thank you all down my row. Uh, I just wanted to thank you all for a wonderful panel discussion and for bringing to us in New York many things that come from outside of New York. But I did want to point out something to follow up, follow up what was being talked about just at the last part of the panel, which is opening on Saturday yes. at the National Museum of the American Indian mm -hmm. is an exhibition called Native Fashion Now. Mm -hmm. It's going to be accompanied by a two-day panel discussion, April the 20th and 21st about the very things that we talked about in terms of design that's emanating from native creative people, which also takes into consideration history, the p present, and the future. So I would encourage all of you who got that part of the talk and thought, interestingly, I'd like to know more about design in the absence of appropriation, or appropriation as done in native terms, you might want to come on April the 20th and 21st, <coughs> or to even see the exhibit before that at the NMAI downtown. Thanks, Thank Elizabeth. you. We're glad you brought that in to the space. Oh, well, Molly, you have to get all the way over there. <laughs> if you think you can, if you think you have a loud voice, you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, okay, I have a really loud voice. Um, my, I wrote down my question to, you know, avoid wasting your time. Uh, but basically, um, my question is informed by a roundtable discussion about peace at the Queens Museum, and particularly the, uh, from the contributions given by the Apache Stronghold members and their fight to protect Oak Flat. Um, if you don't know what that is, definitely Google it later. So how is the desecration of sacred land, which is truly all the land that we live on, not a violation of our uh, religious freedoms as Americans? Who wants to? Who wants to take that one? How is it not it a violation? <laughs> the treatment seems like it's more of an environmental problem when in reality, for indigenous mm -hmm. peoples, it's a religious, you know, mm -hmm. it has religious implications. There are a couple of ways yeah. to answer that. Mm -hmm. the, the most quickest is, it, it is a, an impediment mm -hmm. to religious freedom. And so uh, I think it, in a real life case study, Dakota Access provides, we have an area of law and the non-application of that law has really effectuated uh, the situation. Um, in Dakota Access, um, they had subscribed to an EIS. This EIS would have then triggered what's known as the National Historic Preservation Act. When you have the National Historic Preservation Act, it requires this form of what I call the, the rarefied type of <laughs> consultation. It's called 106. It is federally enforced, i.e. you can sue the other party for inappropriate kind of consultation, i.e. tribe to the federal government. Within that, you can identify cultural um, pieces that may have some kind of adverse effect. And the purpose of this consultation is to move towards um, a, 
either a programmatic agreement or an MOU to say these are the ways that we are going to mitigate or minimize the effect. In that situation, it, it is no surprise why the administration superseded and said through this executive order, we kind of order the uh, Army Corps to not do an EIS. So even in, in the situation where we had something that would have provided at least a check and balance to the articulation that there are religious and cultural kinds of perspectives that need to be framed and articulated, there is a, they usurp the, the process. And, and so that makes it extraordinarily frustrating because we had a, uh, an area of law and public policy which would have addressed that specific item. Mm -hmm. I would I say that, um, uh, and, and go ahead, Cecilia, please. Well, and I think, I think it gets to what Jess Brown was saying about commodification, mm -hmm. um, that overall I think however this society has developed historically, it has developed the scientific um, enterprise has created an understanding that our natural world is without a spirit. And because that Western scientific way of understanding the world dominates, it allows for exploitation of our environment, our land, our water, as an understanding of them as resources. Mm -hmm. without, li without life, resources to be exploited for profit. Um, and until we change that consciousness, I think, and really infuse um, science with a moral content about that, we're gonna continually be butting up against that. And, there, and scientists are doing that. That's why scientists are embracing traditional ecological knowledge and other forms of understanding the world is that. But that, if you don't have that moral check on things, then it is a violation. It, there is no reason for not to violate those resources and those lands. I, I would just add that, in my opinion, it is inexcusable for somebody who calls themselves an environmentalist or a conservationist to not understand uh, that it is Mother Earth, to not understand that uh, the Earth does have a spirit, to not understand uh, the cultural and moral issues that we're talking about right here. I, um, I, you know, as I said, I was very, very fortunate to, as a, as a New York City girl, to uh, be able to interact uh, quite young in my career in the environmental world with uh, indigenous peoples in, uh, uh, in uh, Wyoming, in Alaska, in Minnesota, and um, it has informed and changed the way that I work in this mm -hmm. world and in this work mm -hmm. and forever will. So I, um, I'm actually challenging all of you sitting here today uh, to do the same. Uh, we have a question here. Hi, Caroline, Hi. Uh, final semester environmental policy student. Thank you again for being here. Uh, I wanted to ask you to speak specifically about indigenous voices and climate change and um, a story that sort of put the complexity into framework for me was from uh, someone from a community off the coast of Alaska, and which uh, the community, they're losing not only their home, but their way of life to the sea because of sea level rise. But in what seems to be yet another form of colonization, uh, they're also dependent on the tax revenue of fossil fuel exploitation. Okay, so, um, Cecilia. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Carolyn. That's my <laughs> <laughs> I did not plant her. So, indigenous perspectives on climate change. Yes, I mean that is the that is the contradiction that we're living in today, right? That not only are indigenous people and native people on the front line um, of uh, the impacts of climate change 
as you were, as you have so eloquently stated. Um, but the practices that act, have actually created climate change have been the same practices that exploited Native people to begin with. So we're in this very difficult situation now. So how do you how do you um, how, how do you resist against those structural issues? And particularly the fossil fuel, the Alaskan situation is, and, and Joanne and Michelle can answer this much more. Um, in a, in a much more expert way than I can. But I think what, what we have to do as indigenous people um, is begin to articulate that, um, that, that climate change <coughs> is the product of a particular way of life. Mm -hmm. And that this way of life has been institutionalized into the fossil fuel industry. We cannot operate on a daily life without the fossil fuel industry. And we're all beneficiaries of that in some way or another. The sacrifice is exactly what we're talking about, the climate and the Earth's ecosystem itself. So what we have, what we have now is this very difficult tension that we have to both adapt to this changing climate the traditional practices of Alaskan Village, Louisiana, you all were involved with the negotiation of that situation. I would love for you to talk about the whole, all of that situation about what went on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you would. Yeah, yes, we were. Uh, <laughs> I, I want to ask Mai to jump in here too. If you and your, uh, your friends have thought about how to move forward in the future with a different paradigm. You know, not accepting what uh, you know the this generation is is leaving you or, or handing you, and what you know. What are your thoughts mm -hmm. in terms of how you can make changes for the future? Yeah, um, I wanted to say that. I was going to answer your question anyway, that yeah. it's not just that, it's not just like that you can't have a conversation about climate change without indigent, without talking about um, colonization or exploitation of indigenous people. It's that you can't have that conversation without them being, without saying that they're in the forefront, like they have to lead, like indigenous communities are the ones that are leading the conversations, they're already trying, we're already trying to say and do things about it. It's just not, we're not being listened to or heard, we're not giving the opportunities to. Like I remember reading um, the jazz <laughs> class, mm -hmm. jazz class, um, like the UN, I mean the UN is so problematic in a lot of ways, but like their pamphlet on like environmental, and there was like one little chapter of like, like mm -hmm. four pages or something of how indigenous communities are trying to do something. Mm -hmm. And the, we absolutely have to um, speak up or let indigenous people speak up more, give that space for these issues, not just because indigenous communities are the ones that face it the most, right. but because they're the ones doing the most work and they have the most knowledge of Mother Earth because they've been, if you look at indigenous communities, their ancestors, their grandparents have been passing down information um, and I also want to tie it back to what we're talking about with fashion. Mm -hmm. I know that's going back, but I, I think that it's not just about making sure that we're, that we're not culturally appropriating anyone else, but I think it's also about um, clothing waste and sustainability mm -hmm. and making fashion something that's not like, dam that not, like um, destructive ecologically. And I think that's like goes hand in hand if we're talking about like decolonized fashion, <laughs> because right, because the indigenous communities colonization, colonization um, produces like climate change, has produced climate change, mm -hmm. and keeps on doing it. So th these things like that conversation, like just it's like one and the same, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. We have to break the cycle. <coughs> yeah. Molly. 
Thanks, Maya, for your wise words. I'm wondering if any of the rest of you on the panel, in addition to appreciating the work of young people in this very scary time, can just speak to how you're explicitly supporting the work of young people, not just through education, but otherwise. Then we're going to get one more question <laughs> before we right. finish. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So we'll just go down, and who wants to speak? Go ahead, Johanna. So, no, absolutely. And thank you for asking that question, because I think we all have a responsibility to do that, right? In what, whatever way we can, whether it's how, if it's, if it's movement building, if it's creating opportunity. I am actually really blessed um, to be working on a project right now um, at the intersection of arts and technology. Right, called Sisters Matter. So Sisters, and it's science, technology, art, robotics, really targeting young women of color. There's all, a lot of talk about technology and opportunity and technology, and yet in that discourse, there's not talk about culture, and there's really not a targeted effort to really be inclusive of young women of color. They are wildly unrepresented, right? So that's one way, to leave, leave the federal government and no longer be an employee, but you know, find like-minded people out there who are passionate about this and who can come together and think about and create opportunity and importantly involve the, involve the, the, the voice of youth in that process, right? You know, we have some really good ideas, but we're 50 and 60 and 70, my partner in crime sitting right here helping as we think about trying our best building on the experiences that we have, but ensuring that, that those voices, those young voices are there as architects in some of the efforts that we're doing too. So in this instance, it's really about you know, going right into the community and, and, and working as best we can. And then I have to just say, really trying hard, and this is a big challenge, to just on a daily basis be a role model. You know, to wake up in the morning and live life in a way that gives honor to the sacred. It is an example for young people to look to. Um, and often they're doing it for us too. You know, it is reciprocity for sure. For me, it's to be really conscious about it. I think when we speak about diversity, um, the easy ones are gender, color, ethnicity. Um, but we often don't make a concerted effort to have a seat for younger people. And it's, it's really important, especially from um, the way that I was brought up, as well as what I think is my particular kind of native management style. And that management style is you need to assume my position. None of these positions are those for us to just kind of hold on to. They're, they're, they're to me, just the, if the verbiage of my title helps me do my job, that's fine. But the title doesn't mean anything to me. And so I need to bring uh, the, the next person into it. And so my thing is, is how do I create succession planning while I'm doing my job. And I'm very conscious about that, that there are people that are looking at me, but as I do that, I am actively engaging them, coming through the door so they can sit in my particular position. And so for me, it's, it, it's having a conscious kind of effort that um, is, is manifested in the actual action of that person taking my position at some point. Jessica. <laughs> Um, so for me, it's a couple of things that stand out in particular. Um, it's easy to say we want youth at the table, indigenous youth at the table. It's another thing to do that in a real meaningful way so that it's not sort of a one-off opportunity or tokenistic. Um, and so I think part of what I've tried to do in my position is to create um, long-standing opportunities for young people to be attached to the work that I do. And that means I support organizations that support young people. Mm -hmm. So the Native Youth Sexual Health Network, Justice for Girls, the Red Nation, which was founded in Albuquerque, organizations that are actively working to foreground the leadership of young people and to place them and their experience um, front and center. And then, you know, as a university professor, we have countless opportunities to leverage the resources and platforms that we have access to in spaces like this to provide networks and opportunities for young people to learn to come to New York. Um, actually, next week, on, on Saturday, a group of five indigenous youth from northern Saskatchewan are arriving in New York City to speak about youth suicide at the Permanent mm. Forum. Mm. Um, and so, you know, those of us that are at the New School in NYU have worked together to try to support them to arrive so they can be here to share their experiences, their knowledge, to be able to provide leadership and direction on questions that they're written about, are written about them all the time, but they rarely have the opportunity to um, provide leadership and direction in. 
Um, so those are some of the things that I do kind of concretely on the ground. I also have a young daughter who, as I said, is, is doing this work and so I'm supporting her to support Indigenous youth to be kind of work in tandem around these questions. Um, I would break that question down into two. One is practice and one is program. So um, we, um, and just to, just to put an Indigenous um, background to that too, um, it, 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 most Indigenous tribes understand that, well, we all do. We all understand that children are sacred, but there's a uniqueness to Indigenous practice and culture that, that teaches us or says that children actually have a lot to teach adults. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually a little bit of a twist on your question in the sense that um, part of the practice is also opening up ways in which we can actually learn from the children themselves. So it's not you know, adult to children mentoring, it's actually children to adult mentoring <laughs> that is part of the practice. Um, and in, and you know, just in terms of practice of, of my daily work, I mean, and there's a number of ways. It's being, a, it's continuing to be a part of the community. It's continuing to be a mentor and, avail, and available as much as I can to, to youth in whatever situation they're in, youth who are, um, who are in alternative schools, youth who are in college programs, youth um, at all levels and whatnot, is to be available and to be a, a, good, a good relative, to be a good member of the Native community is, is the practice. In terms of program, uh, my organization, when I'm not at the new school, the Center for Earth, Energy, and Democracy, have, has developed a number of youth programs, and we've developed a specific new Native youth program that's a lot more difficult because you need resources to do that. And when, you do, and when you don't have resources, you want to be able to support those youth and to also provide them with some resources to, to participate in your program. Funding is a very difficult thing to come by in developing those programs. So we're struggling with that. We're still trying, but it, it is a big struggle. Maya, what have we forgotten? What, what else can we do to be able to support young people? I would say, I mean, there's, there's like uh, so many things, but definitely, um, I would say definitely f funding is important. And also um, doing more things like this, like having intergenerational conversations, mm -hmm. uh, panels, mm -hmm. not having, you know, like, and also just discussions, inviting, um, having like young people come um, into classrooms to talk to their other peers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and things like that and funding for programs like, um, so, like, social, like social programs and mm -hmm. obstacle programs. And I mean, it's a lot, but I, I would say like, of course there's so many things, but I think intergenerational conversations are really important too. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> it is the last question, and then we uh, will be inviting uh, Martha and Sony back up to take us home. Hi, my name is Masum. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this, uh, Tetsi, and thanks so much for sharing your knowledge. This is really great. Um, I wanted to learn a little bit more about uh, what kind of economic system aligns with the indigenous worldview and value systems. And how is it playing out on native land? Is there a need for support for small businesses, developing cooperatives, or something completely different? Like, what is it that makes young people stay on native land or leave? Like, what kind of work do they have to do? So I just want to learn a little bit more about how the economics plays out on native land. Thank you. Good question. I'm, I'm glad we're going to fit that in. So, yeah, Cecilia, Joanne, jump on in. Well, you know, it is a unique, and, and Patrick and Joanne could speak more to this, but, but, but stay, at least in the, in the United States, the, the, the historical problem of having um, Indian lands was a huge problem that we held it in common. It was trust. And so the traditional capitalist economic system that only recognizes 
private property was a huge hindrance to sort of economic development in Indian country for a long time. And you know, as we all know, one of the, one of the ways in which economic development has happened over the last 20, 30 years is actually casino development. Mm -hmm. um, that was an exercise of sovereign rights to be able to do that. But what that has done in some, in some nations, not all nations that have casinos are very profitable, um, but in some cases what that has, has meant is that we actually have access to capital now and to invest in social services, in hospitals, in healthcare, in a whole water systems, in a whole infrastructure that wasn't available before. And I think slowly, and Patrick and Joanne can speak more on this, but slowly that understanding of how economic development can happen on Indian nations where there is a trust, um, where there is trust land as opposed to private property lands has slowly been evolving and there's been a development of Indian um, native um, uh, financial institutions that enable the capital to do that. It's always based on this practice of redistribution though. If you, think, if you see Indian nations, they are redistributing that capital into essential social services, or they're giving it to, or they are actually giving that inter to each member of the society. So, you know, there's th that principle of redistribution and economic development in Indian country is an essential component to, to what we're doing. Right. Patrick, probably you can speak to some of this too, but I think <clears throat> the redistribution is internal, right? As you were talking about to individuals and to support, but it's also um, has always been heartening to me to see um, how the tribes who have resources actually support uh, each other in so many ways. Sometimes through grant, you know, grant making. Sometimes through low, low interest loans. And it's you know, if the state of of uh, New York is having a bad year, I, I highly doubt that the state of Colorado is going to come in and say, let us help you out, right? But mm -hmm. if a tribe is having, one tribe may be having a particular difficult time, often what you see, which I think is part of that practice of redistribution that we referred to earlier in this, is, is, is some of these tribes who, who have had the good fortune of building resources come in and whether it, it may be, as I said, a grant um, it may be supporting the building of, a, of, a, of a, an institution, a school, a hospital, a dialysis center, mm -hmm. infrastructure, roads. Um, it may be providing technical assistance. Um, um, it may be helping the tribe manage its business in certain ways. And so I think we see you know, far more examples than one could imagine. If we started quantifying those examples, um, it, really, it really is millions of dollars that are redistributed from one tribe often to another tribe in support of mm -hmm. building um, economic development. But I'll also say that I think it's the goal of, of almost every nation that I've experienced to actually have opportunities for people to come home, right? To have, to have jobs that people can come, to, whether it's teaching in the schools or being a professor in some of the tribal colleges or, or you know, working, and a lot of folks have that desire. So I also think we're seeing often more and more opportunity of people who may take advantage to say, come be educated at the new school mm -hmm. um, or an institution of their choice that's not close to home, which is sometimes very difficult for folks because it's a long, there's a cultural distance, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that, then they return home. They take that knowledge and experience and go and serve their nation um, and, and are you know, important, vibrant contributors to the, to the, to the larger community. Mm -hmm. Patrick, do you want to add anything? No, I, I would just close that. If you look at um, economies within Indian country, it is a fairly singular example of how they try to touch every member of the community. You would not see a public traded company. Even within that kind of concept, there are common stocks, preferred stocks. Within a tribal community, it is saying, if we're going forward, everyone is going to participate, and how can everyone be engaged? And so. It is really a kind of a, a holistic economy that is being engaged um, within Indian country. And, and, and it certainly has its challenges. You know, some tribes are very geographically isolated. Like all young people, people want to kind of go and explore. But I, I do see definitely a delineation of people coming back. Um, and so part of tribal leadership is, is to integrate that thought of how do we provide for people, but how we also provide opportunities.
Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. I want to now invite Martha and Sony back up to the stage uh, for another song. I'd like to ask everyone to stand up, and I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the song we're going to do. It's entitled Mother, and um, I wrote it in honor of my mom. I lost my mom when I was eight years old and was raised by my brothers. And so this song is in honor of her, but not only her, but all the mothers and our Mother Earth. And um, originally, this song was written. Um, we'd collaborated with an African-American band. And uh, it's a traditional song, but it also was uh, written with traditional African drums. So it, it was a fusion, a fusion of peoples. And we have to recognize and remember that we all help each other through our struggles back 200, 300 years. And we still do it today. We need to help each other. And remember, you want to be treated at, you, as a human being. And we have to remember that. And I want to say that patience is part of that. Maybe they don't talk quick enough for you. Maybe they're not saying the things you want to hear. But you, you have to take the time and listen. They may be teaching you something. They might say that magic word that you've been waiting to hear or a message. So thank you all for coming today. And thank you, Molly, Joanne, and everyone here for being here and giving me strength and remembering those that came before us, and we carry their strength forward. And I want to thank Martha, who's been who's my sister, <laughs> and helping me in this song. So travel home safe. Let me try that again. <laughs>
Martha. Thank you, Miss Sunny. <laughs> Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody.